Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm here to share a very special deck with you today. This one is called the Herbal and Spiced Culinary Tarot. Uh, the creator is Lauren McGurin and the illustrator is Nisa Lovendahl. I hope I'm pronouncing the last names correctly and I apologize if I'm not. So uh, the deck began as a Kickstarter deck and I remember hearing about it um, when they were first generating support for it via Kickstarter. And I don't know why I didn't pick it up then, but I didn't. Um, so I kind of forgot about it and it dropped off my radar until very recently. Um, so I spotted the deck again on the creator's Etsy shop. Um, and wonderfully enough, even the uh, rewards, the different tiered rewards that you could get if you had supported it originally on Kickstarter, uh, seemed to be available on the Etsy shop for purchase. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I guess I'll show those to you now. Uh, so one of those rewards was the um, herbal and spiced reishi cocoa uh, that's blended by the creator herself. And I've already had a cup, it's quite nice. And another one of the rewards is um, this altar deck, or this altar cloth, sorry. So um, you can use it as an altar cloth, you could use it as a tarot cloth. Um, it's the perfect size for a bandana, actually, if you want to treat it as an accessory. So probably uh, quite a lot of uses for it if you get creative. Uh, the box is really nice. Uh, it's a good quality. It seems to have that magnetic closure there at the end. How cute is that? So cute. So I'll read the back for you. The Herbal and Spiced Culinary Tarot is the perfect mystical deck for cooks, herbalists, and kitchen witches alike. The cards retell the story of the Rider Waite Tarot using culinary analogies. Each card offers an herb or spice per card, as well as a culinary suggestion in the guidebook. Ask yourself deep introspective questions, unlock kitchen creativity, or plan your next dinner party. So it's a typical 78 card deck, and although short in stature, it is a meaty little guidebook. And I was pleasantly surprised at the thoughtfulness um, and the depth that went into the creation of the deck and it's really evident in the cards themselves you don't need the guidebook but the guidebook provides just a little more insight and it's it's really worth reading so the love of food just oozes out of the deck and you can start to get that impression just going through the guidebook. There are no pictures in the guidebook. I'm perfectly okay with that. I know that the creator was trying to um, maintain affordability while still um, having high standards with the quality of the deck, the environmental um, friendly printing processes, things like that. So uh, that is a hard um, balance to maintain and I think she did it quite well. So it was really just like getting a present in the mail when it came, super excited, and I couldn't wait to share it with you. So we're doing that now. Let's take a look. We'll move the box out of the way. Um, an interesting side note, which really it shows, I don't think I had to hear this, I think I could have um, guessed it just looking at the deck, is that um, both the creator and the illustrator um, have um, some culinary professional work experience. So they were um, in the trenches in restaurants. Um, I know that Lauren McGurin worked in, I think even Michelin star uh, restaurants and she kind of went at the whole line cook experience professionally pretty hardcore. Uh, that scene can really chew you up and spit you out. Um, and I speak from experience myself. I have nothing but love uh, for the whole profession, but um, my experience being on the line as a pantry chef and then later uh, doing um, 
bakery and pastry at a chef owned restaurant. Um, it taught me a lot, but uh, sacrifice definitely goes into that and you have to have a passion for food. And that's one of the wonderful things about this deck is the passion for food definitely shines through. So uh, the four suits are a little different. Aren't these backs adorable, by the way? So cute. And now you can see like a better look at the tarot cloth that comes with it. So she's renamed them, but all, you know, the familiarity is there. So we have, let's see, the cup stayed the same and it makes sense. And I guess you could say it's a pip deck, but if you don't like pip decks, don't worry, you're not alone. I do not usually use pip decks. They have to be special. They have to have some kind of personalization that they're not just a thoughtless, you know, repetition of a symbol. And uh, these definitely meet that requirement. So we'll look at them more closely. So cups remained the same, but then you have mushrooms. That would be your wands. You have, instead of pentacles, oysters. Okay, and this is just brilliant. A whole suit for oysters, you must be a foodie. And last but not least, tools for swords. All kinds of tools. And you get to see that image of the, the knife, which would remind you of the sword anyway, you know, repeated at least a couple of times. Okay, so that's just a look at some of the changes that you can expect with the suits. The Major Arcana also had some very thoughtful changes, but if you're familiar with Rider Waite Smith, um, symbolism and the usual organization of the major arcana, then um, it will make good sense to you. And a couple of them I had to think about. Uh, and once I did, um, I thought that the connections were beautiful and they were excellent choices. So let's just take a look at those. You start right away, instead of the fool, you have the stage. And if you're familiar with um, the term, uh, then you'll recognize that as basically the, the newest newbie of the noobs, at least at a particular restaurant. They may have some excellent culinary experience elsewhere. They uh, may have graduated a wonderful um, program, but um, like a culinary school or something. However, um, they're there uh, as a new person willing to do anything that the chef asks of them or anything that the restaurant desires. So some people are greatly humbled um, and they only get to stage for a week or two and they never do anything. They never get beyond just peeling the onions. It's an unpaid position. It's sort of like um, an, uh, it's sort of like an internship, I guess, but it's less organized and it's not going to necessarily tick off all of the boxes that a, an internship um, would. So when you look at the stages experience, um, it, it really is diverse. They never know what each day is going to bring. They never know what's going to happen next. Um, they may never get past peeling onions or peeling potatoes, um, or they may get the opportunity to keep growing, keep assisting, keep moving up. There's always that hope and dream um, for a stage if they got into a restaurant that they greatly admire um, or got to work in a kitchen under a chef that they greatly admire. There's that hope that they'll be kept on, that maybe it'll turn into a paid position. But even if not, some people do it just for the experience, just for a chance to live in New York City for a while and put on their resume that they did do work in a, in a reputable kitchen. Same for um, abroad. A lot of times people will do a stage at a Parisian kitchen, for example, a nice French kitchen, uh, just to say that they've done it. Um, so this is really a beautiful um, connection here that you have all of that youthful optimism, uh, not really knowing what life is going to throw at you. And it's definitely guaranteed to have um, some curveballs and some disappointments 
Uh, it's probably going to be more work than a naive um, fool kind of archetype was expecting. Um, it's it's a beginning. It's a kind of beginning and it is risky and it is exciting and it takes courage and it will have all kinds of ups and downs. And uh, there are cliffs that one could step off of um, every day of their stage experience, I'm sure. So I just thought it was brilliant. The magician and she has molecular gastronomist, which um, would be like a like a Heston Blumenthal kind of a character where, you know, really cutting edge science and technology and experimentation um, meet the food world. And um, things aren't always traditional and it's full of surprises. Uh, and you're really just as good as your um, imagination and knowledge, you know, allows you to be. So I thought that was very clever. The High Priestess is um, the gardener, which is wonderful. I also like some of the diversity we see in the images of the people. Um, making all these full connections too. We're not just staying in a professional kitchen world or a restaurant world. We're making all these connections between people and you know, food being this great equalizer in a way. That's kind of an, an undertone or a recurring theme, I'd say, to the, to the overall feel of the deck. Um, this one I love as well, the Empress, really blowing the gender stereotypes here, releasing us from those hard and fast gender limitations from the old imagery. And we see um, the domestic genius is the Empress. And the Empress here is in the form of what looks to be a loving father, right? Taking care of all the things uh, on the domestic scene, including some cooking. So the Emperor is the chef. I mean, perfect, right? So chef really is um, kind of like saying uh, boss or chief or, you know, some kind of authoritative uh, title in the kitchen. And... Um, it's definitely emperor imagery for sure. The Hierophant is the farmer, definitely. Um, and when you're falling in love with food, like really getting to the source of where it came from and seeing how important all of the knowledge from the very beginning, from, from the birth of whatever it is that you're eating. Um, and I just mean that figuratively, not literally. So it could be the birth of the vegetables that you're eating as well, right? Um, it matters. It's really age old knowledge. Um, some of it's structured, some of it not as structured. For the lovers, you have the picnic. And that's a really nice scene. Again, there's a suggestion of, um, you know, some more progressive imagery, which is always nice to see. Another thing that I like about it is it's not forced, it doesn't seem to be like tokenism. Uh, this looks like a really natural, you know, loving picnic in the park kind of scene. And that captures a lot of lover's energy. This one was interesting and I, um, I had to think about it. So instead of it being the chariot, it's the vegan. Um, and if you are a vegan or you have a, a somewhat um, restricted, uh, I hate to say restricted because it sounds negative, but if there are certain foods in your life that are off limits, um, maybe as a vegetarian or um, maybe you're just, I don't know, gluten-free or non-dairy or something like that, um, then you are met with harnessing your appetites and digging deep into your direction and your goals and your power and staying focused on the path and all of that same energy and um it takes courage, it definitely takes courage and it takes a lot of determination and willpower and I see all that energy in, in the chariot. So I love that it's represented here um, as the vegan. So interesting. Strength is the line cook. Hell yeah it is. So on the line, um, it's like going to war every day uh, when you're doing it, uh, it's, physically exhausting. It is mentally taxing because of maintaining standards. If you're working somewhere that's particularly um, skill-based and reputable, especially, um, 
dealing with all of the personalities in the back, keeping the order straight, the speed, the timing, timing with the other people on the line at the other stations. If you have that brigade kind of scenario, um, I mean, it's an incredible um, dance and you're tested every day. And I think, um, I was trying to think um, who said it, who's famous for saying, uh, you're only as good as your last service. Oh, I just lost the name, Anthony Bourdain. So um, it really feels like that. It doesn't matter how much you've kicked ass in the kitchen, uh, you know, every night for the last six months, um, you know, if, if you tank, <laughs> you feel that, you feel the weight of that and it's like starting all over for the next shift again the next day. Um, so I think that's a beautiful one for strength. Uh, I personally have never held a job that required more strength. Table for one, isn't that beautiful for the hermit? How wonderful. I just recently had a dining out by myself experience. I went um, out of state to read uh, tarot and oracle at um, an outdoor event. It was a two-day event, so I stayed at a hotel, and I just went by myself. Sometimes I take my daughter with me. Sometimes friends meet me there. Uh, this time I was just completely solo, and um, it was interesting. The old me, the younger me, would have gotten all the food to go and brought it back to the hotel because I didn't feel comfortable eating out um, alone in public, and I realized it had been quite some time since I had tried it again. Uh, and when I did it this time, I was in a whole different place. It was peaceful, it was enjoyable. Um, I was able to, to tune out a, a lot and I was a lot more confident and comfortable just in my own skin and, and with the experience. Uh, and I just enjoyed it for what it was. And it wasn't even a really great restaurant or anything, but it was a sit down. Um, meal experience and I now see the connection here um, with the hermit. Like there's, I don't know, maybe two perspectives, you know, in the world there's I can eat out alone and I can't. And I've been in both camps. Um, I'm very happily now in the I can camp. There is wisdom in it. There is contentment. There's inner entertainment. You don't need to be distracted or entertained. You don't need to bring a book with you to not look awkward. You don't need to care or give a crap about what someone thinks you look like when you're out and eating a meal by yourself. So you'll see the next one. Um, is the food critic, which is our substitute for wheel of fortune. And uh, that is the truth. Um, I, I would say you could have also, well, I guess that counts the food critic. I was gonna say like um, reviews as well, <laughs> like just the Yelper or the reviewer, but I guess they are being a critic, but the food critic would be a very high end uh, version of this. You know, it could really um, make or break your fortune for a little while and have a lot of influence. And again, you may just be being judged on their one visit or two visits. Uh, and the same goes for reviews as well. So that up and down, that wheel of fortune, some things are out of your hands. You can just do what you can do and do your best. And at the end of the day, there's going to be a little bit of chance and there's going to be a little bit of um, stuff that's out of your control. It's just out of your control. The forager is our justice card. And that's interesting, I'm glad the forager was included and that's a growing movement uh, and it's really interesting, especially when it's taking place really close to cities or just outside cities or even in the suburbs. It's amazing what you can forage, what is growing, that is edible. Um, and you can start in your own backyard. You know, you can start with something as simple as dandelion greens for your salad or something like that. The picky eater. Um, is this maybe the food critic a little bit, but this one definitely is my first sign that um, the deck does have a sense of humor uh, and it becomes more obvious as we go along here. Um, so even though it, it doesn't shy away from the big heavy themes, uh, there's something really funny about the picky eater being the hanged man. I mean, you are keeping yourself in stasis. So all you picky eaters out there that haven't quite advanced that palate from, you know, 12 year old you, um, 
it, it'll take courage and it'll take movement. It takes direction. You, you'll you get stuck. And it's okay to be stuck for a while if you fall in love with the food and you just stay with that one thing and you just dig it for a while. But then you definitely, there's going to be a time when you want to move on. And I, I like that it's shown as a child because typically those picky eaters are children. Uh, but you do see it stay. You see people get stuck there a lot longer. Compost, can you guess what that one is? Uh, don't peek at the number, right? How beautiful, what a beautiful representation of death. It's totally capturing that transformation and you know, new life will come out of it. Um, it's, it's being transformed and you see it, you see how it's going in and you see that rich, nutrient rich, vitamin rich um, dirt that's going to grow so many things coming out. Um, yeah, I really like that imagery. Mirepoix, how lovely. Again, I really like the images. Um, I like the facial expressions when they show up as well. There's something peaceful about the muted colors uh, and everything that's going into each card. Um, so that's our temperance. And you see just finding that balance and you see enjoying just the pure ingredients and the balance there. Junk food, that's our devil card and um, another sign of the deck's humor for sure. Well, that is hilarious to me and lighthearted and it's not demonizing the junk food. Um, it's, it's just acknowledging the junk food and it's siren call, right? Um, but it plays a role as well. The burnt souffle. So I did quite a bit of baking uh, professionally. And it's not just souffles, man. It's like <laughs> people coming and uh, checking to see if there's anything in your oven instead of asking you. Like all the people scurrying around the kitchen and they slam the door when they see your bread's in there and the bread falls. Like the bread fell quite a bit when people did things like that. Um, it's it's very time sensitive, um, a souffle is, and you can see her timing was just off, right? So that's the tower and everything fell. Uh, and you can see that happen with so many dishes. Uh, and I know people have these experiences at home and you spend so much time working on it and then you just miss the mark and it's like, oh, crash and burn, you just gotta start all over. The herbalist, that's our star. Look at these soothing colors. Again, just like peaceful expression on the face. The simplification, it's minimal enough, but not too minimal. There's just enough to read here. There's just enough to work with. Okay, hilarious. So instead of the moon, mystery meatloaf. That is so funny. So it's like you see it, but you don't really know what all is going on here. You don't, you don't see everything. You're not quite sure what's inside it. Um, this might be a good time just to do like an example, especially because this is a funny one. Let's see if we can find it in the book. So you can kind of see if you looked it up, what your experience would be like. Okay, so if you got mystery meatloaf, and then in parentheses, you can see. She tells you what the traditional, you know, association is, that that's card 13, the moon. I mean, sorry, 18, the moon. Um, have you ever been presented with a mystery meatloaf before? Chances are your imagination serves up a scenario far more frightening than the product actually ends up being. Maybe your memory of a lousy past experience with food comes to the forefront, clouding an objective approach to the dish in front of you. There's a lot of complexities to our individual biases that we fail to acknowledge. This analogy will be of use to you at this moment as you tackle some unsavory fears of your own. Have you been holding on to some unprocessed trauma? Is some boogeyman lurking at the edge of your dreams? Feel into a situation because nothing is as it seems on the surface. If you let go of some of your preconceived notions, you may be pleasantly surprised with what you are served by the universe at the moment. So then remember, um, when I read the back of the box, 
Um, it explained that there would be a food um, and an herb message as well. And she did include reversals. So the food message is forging in the depths of your fridge is a great metaphor for the unconscious. You never know what you've lost and forgotten on the back shelf. Clean out the drawers and make a meal with what's salvageable. So if you just sit with that for a second, that's well, it's actually pretty deep. It's actually helpful and applicable in lots of situations if you were to get that in a reading. Um, and then the herb. Mugwort is the perfect herb to help you reach into the depths of your mind. For one, it grows in urban and woodland spaces alike. For another, it is an excellent herb for raw salads or for a mugwort soup pureed with potatoes. Lastly, mugwort is traditionally associated with astral projection and lunar magic in folk tradition. This trifecta of qualities makes this herb an unstoppable force for whatever enchantments you seek in your own life. Well, there you go. And so now the, the creator's, you know, witchy magical self is definitely showing. Uh, we definitely saw her, her foodieism, and, and now we see that magical side. It was really nice. And reversed, it's saying, perhaps this weird meatloaf is actually the stuff of your nightmares. You don't trust the person serving it to you isn't trying to kill you. Cultivate a little bit of trust in the unknown. Don't throw out your food when no one is looking. You might miss an opportunity to master your anxieties. A lot of it focuses on that call to action approach as well. When you see the meanings, uh, they explore your worldview, your perspective, your mindset, um, all of those things, which I think is ultimately the most helpful in a reading. The Sun card is the Nona, which is evoking that Italian grandmother kind of archetype, which gives you all of those warm, happy feels. If you have that experience of cooking with a grandmother or grandfather figure, um, or really just an older adult when you were young, um, you can probably harken back to those childhood memories. You get all of the warmth here. And it's funny, you don't have the official sunny colors or the sun. I guess you might think of the, the sunny yolks in the eggs, um, but it translates still nonetheless. And we're getting there with the major arcana. This is pretty hilarious. The auntie is, um, is our judgment card. So um, I think most people can relate to having some kind of relative with whom they felt particularly personally judged by. Um, and maybe it's just that the person was, um, you know, the kind of personality type that corrected or had high standards. Uh, and maybe in other cases, you know, there's some baggage there that they really were kind of harsh and personally judgmental of them. Um, but you can kind of see in this scene, it's so simple, but it really captures it between the name and the image. She's giving instruction, she's giving guidance, but you get that uh, suggestion that maybe there's a little little fear of, of criticism or judgment or disappointing her um, in the scene where they're, they're baking together. You get the impression that the auntie wants things just so. She's hovering quite close and, and the hand gesture says it all. You know, she's giving very precise instructions. So that's our judgment card. And then the world ends so appropriately uh, with the feast and that really captures it all. And you see all the different hands and all the different food. Uh, we don't see their faces, but we don't need to. I mean, it is a food centric deck. Uh, and it, that really is the culmination of all the work and all the food that we saw from all the archetypes uh, prior to this point, right? It's all kind of building up to this, this moment, and this certainly gives us that final big sense of completion. That's how it would play out. So I'll go more quickly through um, the suits, and as I said, so we're in cups, they are pippish, but it's not a deal breaker for me because, well, for example, cups, it's not just one cup and then two cups and they're all the exact same cups and nothing's going on, right? So here you have 
you know, the cool, what ice water looks like. And then you've got, you know, a couple of martinis for the two of cups and it captures that, okay, we're together, it's two people and it's different. And then the three of cups, well, we've got some ale, right? And the four of cups, we've moved on. It's capturing the five of cups, right? Look, there's that. I always use that analogy when I do readings for people. I always say um, it's the don't cry over spilled milk message of a card. I'm sure a lot of you say that too. Uh, when you read it, it, it kind of comes naturally um, when you're looking at the traditional images of the five of cups. Um, and But there you have it. It's, it's not just cups. Like it's been reduced and simplified uh, and you're seeing vessels for sure, but it it doesn't quite count as a pip deck for me. This is not a pip deck. It's getting close, but it's not there. Six of cups, a seven of cups, and like the warmth and look at the detail there. I also really dig the mix of um, abstraction and then those little touches in most images of uh, naturalism. So like here, that looks like a real boxed wine, right? Like that's real wine coming out. You can see we've added like some highlight to it and stuff, but everything else is just muted and simplified basic lines. And then here, it's like the, the marshmallows are real in the Nine of Cups, and then everything else is just a very, you know, simple drawing. Same for the Ten of Cups. And so you just find these little touches of naturalism when you're looking at the images. So it gets just real enough. I think that if it didn't have that piece to it, it would be easy to to be less tuned in, less dialed in. Uh, you, you might get kind of um, desensitized to the imagery, especially because they are uh, pretty muted colors. But when you have these little bits of realism, it just keeps you hooked in. It also shows the range of the artist. So now we're into mushrooms. We're just sticking with those earthier tones to start it out. Like see there, it's just just the right touch of naturalism. There aren't a lot of decks that look like this really. It's very unique in a lot of ways. So takeaways for the deck, this is just me personally. Um, it's definitely unique. Uh, if you're a collector, you want it. If you're a reader, you might want it. It reads very well. Look at the Queen of Mushrooms. Look at that truffle snoofing hog. Like, that's amazing. That looks fantastic. And if you think about it, it makes really good sense. Um, the King of Mushrooms, we're moving on to tools. And I thought this was a really interesting idea as well. So it's unique. It's also, if you're a foodie, you definitely would want this deck. Um, but yeah, it reads so, so nicely. Um, it has great potential for death. Um, it is diverse in all the right ways without being self-conscious and uh, without having that tokenism that I mentioned before. I guess it's pipish, but I, if, if you have an aversion to pips, you may still vibe with this deck. I do. Um, it's not redundant. There's not the redundancy of the pips. There's not the lack of detail and interest and thought that you often see with pip decks. So for me, it passes the pip test. Um, something to keep in mind is it doesn't overtly align with the elemental associations for the suits. It's not like a harsh, um, you know, overt fire association, you know, with wands and things like that. I'm not saying you can't get glimpses of it. And if you already have that knowledge that you're bringing with you uh, to read it just from your Rider weight experience, um, you know, you can work it in, but it's it's really not present to be picked up upon, not consistently anyway. Um, what would I change? What would I like to have um, different? I would say, I would have loved to have seen um, some tarot spreads included, like in the guidebook or um, maybe just sent in the packaging when she sends it, um, or maybe even on an extra card in the deck, maybe. Uh, some kind of culinary or food-themed um, tarot spread. 
but I wanted one so badly to go with it that I actually made a couple. And I have a third in the works, but I have a couple that are completed that I just made so that I can play around with this deck. Um, and I will share them on my Facebook page. I'll include the link below, but if you just look up Triple Hair Magic on Facebook, uh, then you'll find me. Um, that's a pretty new thing that I created. I don't know how it's gonna go, and I'll probably make an Instagram to go with it. Um, but you'll be able to find both of the culinary themed um, spreads I made. I made one that's called the Michelin star theme, um, which is a really simple, nice one. And it's just based on the description of what it means to get one, two or three stars. And um, I did a salt, fat, acid, heat theme. Those four essential elements um, of cooking. And I think that one is uh, got a lot of potential as well. So I'll share those there. You can look forward to that. Um, what else did I wanna say about the deck? Thinking, thinking. Oh, I swear I saw somewhere, maybe on her site, um, that Lauren McGurin said that she was going to create possibly a cookbook, like a companion cookbook um, that goes with the deck. And I would be down for that, for sure. Also, I would really love to see an Oracle deck for her to make an Oracle deck, partnered with the same artist. I would love the consistency of the same art uh, and they would go really well together. It's hard to find culinary themed, uh, you know, foodie decks. And then when you do find them, often um, the aesthetic is different or the focus is different and, um, I've been trying to find something to match to go with this deck because generally when I read, especially for other people, I use Oracle and Tarot together. That's just how I like to do it. I know a lot of people do the same. So it would be so great to have an Oracle deck just to go with this. Um, so yeah, that is the Herbal and Spice Culinary Tarot. I don't know if you found it as delightful as I did, um, but it's here for you to enjoy in video format. And I will include the artist Etsy shop link in my description um, under this video as well. So you can feel free to check that out and see what she has to offer. And if you just have to have one, well, you will know where to find it. All right, as always, thanks for watching. Bye.